just feel very called to become a member of the Catholic Church. Love the Catholic Church. It's just the best place to be. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line. In North America, call toll-free 1-800-585-9396. That's 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also send an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know what's better than one hour with you on the radio, John? What's that? Two hours with you on the radio. I, I think you got something there. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. Toll-free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. If you've got a question for our scriptural apologist extraordinaire, Mr. John Martinoni, here on Open Line Monday, if you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is one 205 271 2985 that's one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five. We'll put you straight to the front of the line. You can send us an email, open line at EWTN.com, or you can text your question to John. Text the letters EWTN to five five zero zero zero. Wait for a response. Type your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. I'm Jack Williams, the lovely and talented Elena Rodriguez produces the program, and your call screener is Mr. Matt Gubensky. Our host, as he is every Monday, is the Director of the Office of the New Evangelization and Stewardship for the Diocese of Birmingham and Alabama, President and Founder of the Bible Christian Society, and uh, Toter of Pamphlets Extraordinaire, Mr. John Martinoni. How are you? Doing all right. Christmas is coming. Yes, it is. We're Quickly. not gonna we're not gonna be here on the day after Christmas. No, we're not. So we're gonna record a program when we're done here of brand new stuff for people to listen to on the day after Christmas. That is indeed true. So if you don't get on the program for some reason at the end of the show, stay on the line and we'll talk to you when we start the new show, which will be right after this show. Yeah, and you'll be first in line. That's right. Well that was that clear? It was clear to me. I've been accused of being unclear sometimes, so I just wanted to make sure that was clear. I'm not sure I understand that last part. One eight that was unclear. One eight hundred five eight five nine three nine six is our toll free number. We have an email from Mike. He says, "Why do you pray the rosary?" First Timothy two verse five, which says that there is one mediator between God and man, Jesus. So why do you pray to Mary? And another question given this scripture is, "Why do you have a priest hear confessions when again this verse says?" that I can and will go straight to Jesus. Okay. Um, the I don't, I'm not sure. I guess he's referring to 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, when he says this verse. Uh, and it says, this verse says that I can and will go straight to Jesus. Where does it say that? Um, where in Scripture does it say you should confess your sins straight to God and God alone? That verse isn't in the Bible, at least not that I'm aware of. So, um, Mike, if you know, feel free to email again and, and share that verse with us. But regarding, let, let's start with the confession in um, Matthew chapter nine. That's in the Bible. That is in the Bible, um, unless you were a. Uh, there was one of the early heresies that got rid of, I think, all the Gospels, but Luke. Martin. Uh, Montanism, yeah. You're <clears throat> so Jack, you know, people think Jack doesn't know what he's talking about. Every now and then he does. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 6. Uh, this is the story of the paralytic where his friends bring him to Jesus who's in the house. They open a hole in the roof and lower the guy down and Jesus says... Just uh, read this at Math recently. Yes, for, you know, rise, your sins are forgiven. Verse 6 of Matthew 9. Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees who are taken aback because he said, you know, your sins are forgiven. And they say, who can do that but God, God and God alone, which is basically what uh, Mike is saying here. Well, Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Say, well, that's no big deal. Jesus is God. But then in verse 8... It's talking about how the crowds, after they saw the man stand up and walk away, the paralytic, now healed, 
The crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God who had given such authority. What authority? The authority on earth to forgive sins. It says it right there. To a man, Jesus Christ? Nope. The Bible says, Scripture says, the Word of God says, who had given such authority to men. Plural. So right there, you see that Jesus is telling us, the Word of God is telling us that men have the authority on earth to forgive sins. It's God's authority, but he exercises that authority through men. And we see this very clearly in John chapter 20. On the night of his resurrection, Jesus says to the gathered apostles, um, when he appears to them, uh, receive the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whosoever sins you, you retain are retained. So Jesus gave them directly the authority to forgive or retain <laughs> sins. So that's uh, one thing. Now, First Timothy 2.5 and prayer to Mary and the rosary and so forth. Here's the thing. We pray to Mary in the same sense that we pray to uh, a good friend of ours who we ask for prayer. We're, we're not praying to Mary as if she's God and that Mary's going to answer our prayers because, you know, we, we tried it with God and it didn't work. So let's go to Mary and see if she'll answer our prayer. No, Mary is a member of the body of Christ. She cannot hear our prayer, our requests for prayers. She cannot uh, um, do anything about our prayers, our requests, except by the authority, the will of God. Okay, because she's a member of the body of Christ in heaven so we're asking her as a member of the body of christ to pray for us to add her prayers to our prayers and take them before the throne of god you know james 5 uh in james 5 it says uh, the prayer of a righteous man or that would be a righteous woman as well availeth much well who is more righteous than the mother of god who is in heaven perfectly united to her son jesus in the body of christ so just as we would ask a member of the body of Christ here on earth to pray for us, so we ask a member of the body of Christ, in this case Mary, who is in heaven, to pray for us. And the prayers of the saints in heaven are more efficacious than the prayers of the saints on earth, who are still tainted with sin and, and so forth. So that's why we pray the rosary, we pray to Mary, as, as you would call it. Uh, basically, we ask Mary to pray for us and why the rosary well the rosary if you look at the mysteries of the rosary that we are meditating on when we say all those hail marys they're all the mysteries of the life of christ you know the joyful mysteries from his birth to his death to his resurrection um you know we're meditating upon the life of christ and to get back to the hail marys straight from luke chapter one Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, or Mother of my Lord, pray for me. That's what we're doing. We're asking her to pray for us. Just like we would ask you, Mike. I would ask you, Mike, hey, my mom's sick. She's in the hospital. Would you pray for her? Absolutely, you'd say. Same thing we're doing with Mary. Same concept. Member of the body of Christ praying for another member of the body of Christ. You know, and I don't know the exact number, but I think there's 42 places where the Bible tells us to pray for one another. Yes, many, many places. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. 1-800-585-9396. Talking scriptural apologetics on Open Line Monday with John Martinoni. From EWTN News Nightly in Washington, D.C., I'm Lauren Ashburn with an EWTN News Link. President-elect Donald Trump makes it official picking General John Kelly to head Homeland Security. Meanwhile, reports say Trump is leaning toward ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson for Secretary of State. Morning in Egypt after a suicide bombing yesterday at a chapel near the country's main Coptic Christian cathedral. 25 people died. Officials continue to look into the cause of a warehouse fire in Oakland, California that killed 36 people. Investigators ruled out refrigerator as a cause, but believe it may be the electrical system. And Pope Francis makes 
A passionate appeal for peace in Aleppo. The Pope says we must not forget that Syria is a country full of history, culture, and faith. Looking for a unique setting for spiritual renewal at a religious shrine so beautiful it had to be divinely inspired? And the world's largest religious media network? Start your Catholic pilgrimage today with EWTN. Call 205-271-2966. Podcasts of Open Line are available within 24 hours of live broadcast. Go to EWTN.com and click on Multimedia. Hi, this is Tim Staples from Catholic Answers. Advent is a time of anticipation. We are looking forward to the coming of the Lord, but we consider the coming of the Lord in three senses. He came 2,000 years ago as a historical fact. He will come again at the end of time, but he also comes to meet us at the end of our lives as well. Let us pray this Advent season that we might all prepare well to receive our Lord at his coming. This is Peggy Normandon, host of Call Me Catholic. Hi, this is Tim Staples from Catholic Answers Live. This is Michael Warsaw, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of EWTN, wishing you a blessed Advent from all of us at the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call one 205 271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com To the phones we go. Our leadoff hitter today is Craig in Traverse City, Michigan listening to EWTN on Barriga Radio. Craig, you're on with John Martinoni. Hello, Father. Thanks for taking my call. I was listening to the readings over the radio this week and I mentioned um, I don't remember the exact test but no greater man has been born than John the Baptist, and I think that was said by Jesus, and um, it, it struck me as kind of weird, because I thought, well, by, we just did the Immaculate Conception, so Mary was already born, too. How do those two things go together? Okay. Um, here's the thing. If you look at the context, it's uh, from Luke uh chapter 7 verse 26 what then did you go out to see a prophet yes i tell you and more than a prophet he's talking about john the baptist here this is he of whom it is written behold i send my messenger before thy face who shall prepare thy way before thee i tell you among those born of women none is greater than john those that's a key word uh he doesn't say among all born of women all men or anything among those what's the context He's talking about prophets, John the Baptist being a prophet. And if you look at the, uh, the Douay Reims translation, which is the older English translation of the Catholic Bible, in verse 28 of, of Luke 7, it says, For I say to you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is lesser in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So the, the um, context here is, the the prophet john the baptist there's not a greater prophet of john the baptist he's the greatest of the old testament prophets it's not in comparison to mary and necessarily everyone else that's born but in comparison to uh uh the prophets um does that make sense well it does and one thing you said kind of struck me too was does that kind of mean that mary wasn't born into uh she was born directly into the kingdom of God because of her grace given, and and so her birth is not like the old birth. She was almost the first of the new birth. Well, no, not necessarily, because um, uh, you could say maybe in a sense Jesus' birth, uh, the first of the new birth, but Mary was born, even though she was immaculately conceived and without sin even original sin as well as personal sin throughout her life her mother was not born without sin so her mother gave birth to mary in the same old way everyone every other mother gives birth to their children um nothing spectacular about it so mary's birth was not extraordinary in terms of the the birthing process as was jesus's but uh um mary herself was 
obviously extraordinary, having been immaculately conceived. Okay? Okay. Yep, thank you. You're Thanks, very Craig. welcome. Appreciate the phone call. 1-800-585-9396. Toll free anywhere in North America. Next up is Tim in Fairfield, Iowa, listening to EWTN on Holy Family Radio. Tim, you're on with John Martinoni. I think, thanks a lot, John, for taking my call. Yeah, my question is about uh, Eucharistic miracles as a, uh, evidence for the claims of the Catholic Church. I know there's a lot of, you know, miracles that can happen that there could be, you know, different explanations, but there's been, as my understanding, over 100 Eucharistic miracles, and some fairly recently, I'm not sure where, but fairly recently in Italy, I think the uh, the host became an actual scientifically verified slice of the human heart. So my comment or question is, if it can be scientifically verified that the, the bread of the host become, actually becomes the slice of a human heart, there can be no possible explanation except for the reality of the Catholic claim of transubstantiation. Would you, what's your take on that? Okay, two things. Uh, first, Tim, do you... No, or have you heard of people who are what they call Holocaust deniers? <laughs> yes, I have. And yet we have how much actual film footage, photographs, eyewitness testimonies, etc. It would fill up, the, the testimonies alone would fill up tens of thousands of pages. The photographs and the film would, would probably fill up rooms and rooms of archives. Yet there are people who deny that the Holocaust occurred. You have people living still, some, a few, not as many, uh, obviously, with the, the, the numbers tattooed on their arms, yeah. showing that they were there. Yet these people deny that it happened. So that, the first point is, there are some people that no matter what evidence you give them, no matter what kind of quote-unquote proof you give them, they are never going to believe it. Secondly... What you can do, you cannot prove necessarily that a miracle occurred. What you can show is that there is no scientific explan current scientific explanation for what has occurred. Do you get that distinction? Um, yes, but you know, the, it, just rational thinking process would you know deny the possibility. A bread turning into a slice right. of human heart. Right. Well, you'll have people who will say, well, how do I really know that, you know, the priest didn't do something or they substituted a piece of the human heart when they sent it off to, uh, uh, you know, to be examined by the scientists? Do we have all these, yeah. you know, step by step, everything can be verified? And so you're going to have people who doubt those processes. Yeah, that's true. You know, and, and it should be noted that really, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be cardiac tissue. Right. Because the, the, the whole notion of transubstantiation is that the host retains the qualities of bread. Right. And, and really, there's no less miracle in a consecrated host that does not check out to be cardiac tissue under a microscope oh, than there is one that maybe well, did. And I think that, you know, speaking of the miracle at Lanciano, I think our Lord probably did that from all accounts to bolster the faith of one doubting priest. Right. Yeah. And that's and that's the thing. is, in, in, And I think uh, what Tim's talking about here is there are few other Eucharistic miracles that where the host turned to actual flesh once it was examined. And, um, but again... They're going to say, well, the process was corrupted, yeah, or somebody yeah. substituted something here. You know, you've got the, uh, um, as Jack mentioned, the miracle of Lanciano. There, here it is. It, it's it's uh, blood and heart muscle that is 800, 900, 1,000 years old and hasn't disintegrated into dust. And yet people say, oh, no, that's, that's a joke. That's some sort of... Uh, thing that the catholic church is teaching you know the pope had somebody go in there and they slip in a new piece of heart muscle or something or or no that's actually from the 1920s or something like you know there will be people who doubt no matter what you do but what i will say is for people who are open and who are searching things like eucharistic miracles when you show them 
these things and that they have been rigorously scientifically examined and and uh, the incorruptible bodies of, of many of the saints that it does help provide evidence and i have heard of stories who were that was the thing that brought somebody over to the catholic church or, or that was the thing that maybe started someone on the road to the catholic church so it is important at the right times to discuss these things with people when they're open but no matter what you do, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to doubt the miracle or the process leading up to the miracle. All these things, um, it, no, no matter what you put before them, no matter how much proof, no matter, no matter how much evidence, they're going to doubt. Is that helpful, Tim? Very true. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you for the call. We appreciate it. one 800 585 Nine three nine six is our toll free number. Next up is Shelby in Kansas City, Missouri, listening on KEXS. Shelby, you're on with John Martinoni. Hi, my question for you today is on how to deal or approach a coworker who claims that they used to be a Catholic priest in a nearby local parish, left the priesthood, got married. Um, has a wife and a girlfriend, and is also a Freemason. Should I go to that diocese and inquire about this, or what should I do about that? Okay, just the fact that he's claiming... You, well, you could call the diocese, the diocesan offices, and say, listen, I've got somebody here I just want to check up on, um, and the diocese may or may not be interested. They may or may not give you the information, but just say, I've got someone who's claiming to be a Catholic priest, that he used to be a Catholic priest, and he's trashing and bad-mouthing the, the Catholic Church. Um, is there some information that I could get to verify that he was indeed a Catholic priest? And, um, and see what they say. They, again, they may, give you, they may just say, yes, he was, or, or they, they may not tell you anything. Uh, but it's worth a try. But how, now, let me ask you this. How do you know he has a wife and a girlfriend? Is he free with that information? Yes, he is. He's free with it, and he's also um, talking in depth about how now that he's a Freemason and that um, he's involved in that organization and um, et cetera and things like that. And as soon as he found out that I was Catholic, that was the first thing he wanted to bring up. So I kind of, you know, don't know how to take that as that kind of a devil in disguise type of deal that um, he's trying to get people that he knows are Not Catholic so to, to, to join, you know, the, the Masons, or is this like, is that his... Um, stick that he goes with, you know, I'm, I'm just not really sure how well, to approach that. What I, what I find in these instances, people who, who leave the Catholic Church, they have to confirm themselves uh, in their choice by having other people join them in their bad choice. Uh, and it's the same if you, if you with uh, people who are for abortion. You know, these, these death scorts that are outside the abortion mills that, that accompany the, the clientele into the abortion mill so that they won't stop and, and talk to the, the pro-life folks, the counselors on the sidewalk. Most of those folks have had abortions, and they want other people to have abortions because every abortion that someone else has, that confirms them that, oh, yes, my abortion was a good thing. It was the right choice. There's nothing wrong with it. So what this guy probably is doing is he's trying to affirm his choice by getting other people to agree with it uh, because there's something deep down inside of him saying, you, you messed up, buddy. You, you, you've, you've done wrong and you've, you've blown it and you've left the church, the true church of Christ, and now you're living a lifestyle that is wrong in the eyes of God and you're trying to make believe that it's okay and you're trying to get everybody else to agree with you that it's okay so that's the attitude that he's coming from i would i would almost guarantee so um just keep that in mind as you deal with him and i tell you what we'll we'll come back and talk more about this here momentarily 1-800-585-9396 is our toll free number 1-800-585 9396. We're talking scriptural apologetics 
on EWTN's Open Line Monday with John Martinoni. Mother Angelica, answering the call. Can we have another call? Hello? Hello, Mother? Yes. I'm calling from South Texas, and I want to thank you for all the little little angel coloring books we got from my nieces. Praise I God. just had open heart surgery, and I felt bad, and I wanted to repent because I don't pray as I should have been being a nominal Catholic. Going to church on Sundays, and that was it. After that open heart surgery, it really makes you stop and look at things another way, and I wanted to real quickly pray the divine praises. Sure. Instead of with the blessed be, we should say blessed is God. All right. Blessed is his holy name, and blessed is Jesus Christ, true God, God and true man. Amen. Blessed is the, the name, name of Jesus. Jesus. Blessed, blessed is his most God sacred heart, heart, and blessed is his most precious blood. blood. Blessed is Jesus in the most holy sacrament of our altars. Blessed is the Holy Spirit, our consoler. Blessed is the great mother of God, Mary most Amen. holy. Blessed is her most holy and immaculate conception. Blessed is her glorious assumption. Blessed is the name of Mary, virgin and mother. Blessed is St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. And blessed is God and his angels and his saints and in all creation. Blessed is our God, our creator eternal, most loving Father. Amen. Thank you for this. Amen. I think you got more than a new heart, don't you think? I think the Lord put in a new heart that's different, a new spiritual heart for you. You need to grab it and hold on to it and, and continue to say how blessed is our God. And the greatest gift that God has given you, it seems, huh? for someone who been with a nominal Catholic, the greatest gift was prayer. I can see and hear that that prayer came from your heart, your new heart. But I will pray for you that this new spirit, new heart you have will go on and grow in great love for God. For more about Mother Angelica, visit EWTNRC.com. Tomorrow on EWTN Radio, Open Line host Barbara McWiggin takes all your calls on pro-life issues, 3 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. EWTN. Live truth. Live Catholic. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. It's Monday night. That means the journey home with Marcus Grodi. Tonight, Marcus talks to Chris Hiles. He's a former Church of Christ and Christian Union member, and he'll talk about his journey home to the Catholic Church. That's tonight at 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio and Television. We're talking to Shelby in Kansas City, Missouri, and she's talking, John, about a coworker that's not being very nice. Well, and Shelby, I just wanted to add one last thing is, when you talk to this supposedly former priest and if he tells you, you know, the Catholic Church is wrong on this or that, and ask him, say, well, is Jesus Christ wrong? And see what he said. See if he says, well, what do you mean? On what? He said, well, about adulterers not going to heaven. And see what he has to say, because we have it in Matthew 19 and other places in the, in the scriptures, New Testament, uh, where it talks about adulterers, fornicators, etc., not going to heaven. In fact, you know, they're headed to a very bad place. Um, and if he's very free and open with the fact that he's married and has a girlfriend, then uh, he's basically saying morality means nothing to me. And the moral- And so you can show him Matthew 19. Jesus says, he who divorces his wife, marries another, is an adulterer. Now, he hasn't done that exactly but in essence he is committing adultery um so ask him that question and then i would say um you might want to go to my website it's biblechristiansociety.com biblechristiansociety.com and start getting some uh, uh of the cds there the free cds or the mp3 downloads start boning up on on the catholic faith how to use the bible to defend it um oh and one one last thing just popped in my head on newadvent.org, the website, newadvent.org, there's a Catholic encyclopedia. And across the top, you'll see A through Z. Click on um, 
the um, what, what's the uh, what did she say? This guy Freemason. Is, Freemason. Uh, yeah, I was thinking masonry. Um, click on Freemason, or it may be under M for Mason, and they've got an excellent article there that will give you some information about the Masons and Freemasonry that you might also be able to use in your discussion. And it'll specifically explain why it is not compatible exactly. with church teaching. Yes. Is that helpful, Shelby? Follow. Can I ask one follow-up question? Absolutely. So if I can confirm that he was not a priest, that this is a big lie and a made-up story, what what should I do with that information the next time that I see him? Well, you just say, listen, you told me you were a priest, and the diocese has no record of you ever being a priest. How, why is that? And see what he says. Okay. You know, just make it not... Alrighty. Don't Don't point a finger or anything. Just say, I'm, I'm really curious, because I... You know, called the diocese, and they said, no, nope, they have no information of you about ever being a priest. And go from there. All right, I appreciate it. Thanks, Shelby. Appreciate the phone call. Next stop, Chattanooga, Tennessee. David's in Chattanooga. He listens to EWTN via podcast. David, you're on with John Martinoni. David, are you there? David, are you there? We'll come back to David. We'll head to Cincinnati, Ohio, where Patricia is listening to EWTN on Sacred Heart Radio in Cincinnati. Patricia, you're on with John Martinoni. Steer right to. We'll head to Long Branch, New Jersey. John, hopefully, is in Long Branch, New Jersey, listening on Domestic Church Media. John, bail me out. I'm here. All right. What's your question today? Yeah, I wanted a little clarification. When we talk about the church, I, I just get a little confused. We know, I, I understand the church is the body of Christ, of which Christ is the head, and we, the people, are the body. But then we also say that the church is holy, and all of us, the body of Christ, are not holy. So I'm a little confused about that. Okay. The church is holy in that the head of the church is Jesus Christ, okay? We are holy uh, in, in the sense that, um, number one, when we're baptized, we are perfectly holy. We have no stain of sin, no punishment due to sin, no temporal punishment due to sin. All of that, uh, in case we were baptized after the age of reason and had committed personal sins— all of that is gone when we're baptized. So, in, so the baptized members of the church are holy. Um, those of us who are not in a state of mortal sin are holy. Now, we're not as holy as we can be, could be, and you know we can continually be transformed into uh, holier stages, uh, stage by stage in, of, of holiness, until we are perfectly holy. But uh, we are, in the sense that we are in a state of grace, we are holy. Uh, do we still sin? Yes, we do. Then, then there are those who are in a state of mortal sin, and they are not holy, but they are capable of holiness. But holiness really, in, in terms of the church being holy, it's not so much the members as Jesus Christ, the head, is holy. And the head transmits his holiness, his grace, throughout the body. And we receive that holiness, that grace, through primarily the sacraments, um, as, as if we were receiving you know, oxygen through the blood in a real body or nutri nutrition through the blood in a real body. So uh, in that sense, we are holy. Does that make some sense to you? Yeah, it makes it makes a little more sense to me, you know, when I look at it that way. Can I also um, mention something in reference to a previous caller? Sure. The uh, the per the, when when the issue was the, the denial of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, I've had that conversation with non-Catholics, and even in light of you know, some of the evidence that you talked about, some people would attribute that to demonic forces. I just wanted to mention that. Right, and, and you're absolutely right. That, that is uh, definitely a possibility. One other thing I wanted to mention to you, I'm trying to find real quick here. Um, 
Oh, it's not in. I was going to say marks of the church, trying to find an article. But if you go to Catholic.com and you type in marks, M A R K S, of the church, then some you should get some articles and some other, th- maybe some audio on uh, holiness being one of the marks of the church. And it should help explain uh, a little bit more as well, okay? Great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. We'll go back to Chattanooga, Tennessee. David's in Chattanooga listening via podcast. Maybe. Possibly. David, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right. What's your question for John? John, I wanted to know if you could give me some evidence outside of Scripture that there is one God and not many gods. Okay. Well, uh, you can use basically... Aquinas' reasoning, uh, I mean, Aristotle, I believe it was Aristotle, if, if not even some of his predecessors in, in the Greek philosophical world, who came up with the, uh, the belief that there is one God, because, you know, l- let's use one or two of Aquinas' um, reasons. There's an unmoved mover. You know, everything, everything that's in motion... Well, something put that thing into motion. You know, uh, you could say my parents put me into motion. Their parents put them into motion. And you go back years, uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years to the very beginning. Then something put life into motion. Something, you know, put the universe into motion. Well, what was that something? Well, we call that something the unmoved mover or God. Now, you might say, well, but... Okay, it could have been one of many gods. Well, no, because if you have many gods, they are not the full God that we call God because there has to be one God that is overall, in all, who began everything. He is from whom all motion comes. And the the other gods... Well, they have motion. Well, someone had to put them into motion. Well, here's the uncreated creator, the unmoved mover. So in that sense, you know, without Scripture, Aquinas has the proof of God, uh, the, uh, you know, Aristotle proof of God. Um, You could say the uncaused cause. If there are many gods... Well, where did they come from? Eventually, you know, eventually you have to trace them all back to a point, not points, of origin. Well, what is that point of origin? It has to be the one God who is over all gods, if there are other gods. And St. Paul talks about other gods being the, the, the demons that Old Testament peoples worshipped as gods. So, but they all had to come from somewhere, and that's where you get, you know, fill it in it from a philosophical proof. You can narrow it down that way to there just being one God without ever having to pick up a Bible, because obviously Aristotle had never heard of the Bible as we have it today. One eight hundred five eight five nine three nine six is our toll free number. You know, I spent the end of last week in Des Moines. We had a uh, 10th anniversary party for the Catholic radio station, Iowa Catholic Radio, there in Des Moines. They invited me back to be part of that. It was a wonderful time. And I'll tell you, to be able to drive, then I drove to Omaha and visited the good folks at Spirit Catholic Radio on Friday. And to drive from Des Moines, listening to Iowa Catholic Radio, until I pick up the signal of Spirit Catholic Radio in Omaha. So a two-hour drive, you know, and we have all sorts of mediums, apps on our phones, the computer, the Internet, but to just be able to listen on my radio without having to worry about any other devices was a treat. And if you possibly don't have Catholic Radio in your area and you'd like to experience that, give me a call. My number is 205 795-5756, Seven nine five five seven five six, or you can send me an email, jwilliams at ewtn.com, and we can tell you what you might need to do to help play a role in bringing Catholic Radio to your area. To Edmond, Oklahoma we go. Nick is in Oklahoma listening on Oklahoma Catholic Broadcasting. Nick, you're on with John Martinoni. Hello. Hello, Nick. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, John, I was going to ask you, is uh, 
you know, we've been talking about uh, Mary and the Rosary and uh, transubstantiation, and I wondered, is is the Incarnation considered a transubstantiation? Well, the transubstantiation? I, I could see how you might look at it that way, but... but in in fact point of fact the answer has has to be no that you you transubstantiation is you have the substance of one thing and, and in in the case that we're all familiar with the eucharist the substance of jesus christ or the substance of of bread and wine that is transformed into the substance of another thing in the incarnation that that did not happen you you simply had it is a uh, normal birth process in the sense uh, of, you know, uh, an egg, woman's egg being fertilized, Mary's egg being fertilized, and Jesus uh, as a one-celled zygote and growing embryo, etc., until his, his birth. But it was not one thing being transformed into another. It was God entering into the universe, the physical universe. So it was not God being transformed into a human because God still kept his, his divine nature. He just added a human nature to his divine personhood. So it's one person, a divine person, uh, with two natures, divine nature and human nature. So one thing didn't become another thing. It's just God entered into nature, into the material world, uh, whereas before God was pure spirit. And so there's a difference there. It, you know, and I can see how you might think, well, it's similar, but it, but it is not actually transubstantiation. Now, you might say that the incarnation was in, in many ways like receiving the Eucharist because overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, Jesus enters into your body, into Mary's body. Um, she, she becomes one with God. In that sense, so you you could say it's it's very Eucharistic, but it, it and it so you know in transubstantiation obviously is very Eucharistic, but not transubstantiation itself. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate the phone call. Back to Michigan we go. You're number one in Northern Michigan today, John. Hey. Karen is in Michigan, listening on Barriga Broadcasting. Karen, what's your question today for John? Karen, are you there? Karen, yes. yeah, what's your question for John? Um, I just am not sure what to do about a situation. We have a priest that almost every other week he brings up um, the passage about that we are to believe um, that there should be no more fighting, no more wars, and to melt down our weapons and make farming implements out of them. He says, is this what you believe? And and we've, I've ran into people who uh, don't even come to Mass anymore because they're so tired of hearing it, and there's military people that are offended by it, and people who feel that, you know, we do live in a world right now where there's so much evil that we should be able to bear arms and to protect ourselves, that this passage um, was meant for when Christ returns, and we will be living in a world of peace, and there won't be any need for our weapons any longer. But it's like a broken record every other week, and I am just not sure what to do about it. <laughs> okay. Um, one thing you can do is uh, in, you can, in Luke chapter 3, verse 14, it, it, we've got John the Baptist is what this this passage is is uh, the context of this passage is about John the Baptist, and people were going out to him and asking him, "What should we do? What should we do?" And it said, "Soldiers also asked him, and what shall we do?" Did John the Baptist, the precursor for Jesus Christ, say, "Lay down your weapons, turn them into?" Um, pruning shears and shepherd's crooks and so forth and so on. No. John the Baptist said, rob no one by violence or by false accusation and be content with your wages. He didn't say, leave the army. You know, which if 
this priest and his attitudes, if he's, if he's correct, then that's what John the Baptist should have said, right? I mean, hey, you guys are soldiers? Oh, no, we got it. You know, Old Testament says got to get rid of war and, and fighting and everything. So you guys need to leave the army, take your swords, turn them into uh, pruning shears, etc., and and be done with it. But that's not what John the Baptist says. And then there's a passage, um, I think it's in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Peter pulls out his sword and, and uh, cuts off the uh, servant's ear. And Jesus says, put away your sword. He says, there will be a time for men to, I can't remember the exact quote, for men to wield swords or there will be a time for the sword or something along those lines. Well, why did Jesus say that? If all the swords and, and spears and everything are to be turned into farming implements. So, but, but go to Luke 3, verse 14, and then also try to do it maybe a, uh, uh, an internet search on, on uh, sword, the word sword in the New Testament. And you'll, see, you'll find the passage where Jesus will tell Peter, you know, there will be a time for drawing your sword or using your sword or something along those lines. And then show them to the priest and say, you know, I respect your beliefs, your pacifist beliefs, but, you know, the church does not teach as doctrine and dogma what you seem to be teaching as doctrine and dogma. And it's simply wrong. And we're losing people, you know, because of it. You're turning people away. Just sit him down very calmly and respectfully, to, you know, respectful of him, as his office, and as a person. And say so you're turning people away. Is that your purpose and your intent? You'll say, why are you doing this, Father? You know, and, and just uh, sometimes what happens is you'll find a priest who, you know, what we would call a liberal priest, uh, although I hesitate to use words liberal and conservative when it comes to uh, theology or to the teaching of the church, but a liberal priest who, hey, he, he sees military people in his congregation. He's, I'm going to teach these people. I'm going to show them. And this, and it, it just, what they believe, what they think, even though it's well within the realm of Catholic teaching, bothers him. So he's got to really make a point to drive it home to them that oh war is evil which, which it is it's a physical evil and and sometimes many times even a moral evil but there are some times where it's not a moral evil but he doesn't care about that so he's got to drive his point home so just approach him directly and show him a passage or two from scripture from the new testament and say i think you're getting it wrong you need to change and because you're really upsetting people. And I don't think that's your goal is to upset people. Is it, Father? And go from there. We'll bring it back to the southeast. Monica is in the southeast listening to EWTN Radio. Monica, what's your question today for John? Yes. I, well, I had a situation at my church that I'm very upset about. They're, uh, they're raffling off the first two pews of the uh, church for midnight mass and a parking spot to raise money for the altar society. And I'm just very upset about this. this. Nobody else seems to be upset about it. I didn't know if I was wrong. I, I don't know. I, it just doesn't seem like the way to be spending Advent waiting for the coming of Jesus to be raffling off pews in the church. So I just would like to know what you think about that. Well, my personal opinion... Didn't I see you in the first row at Midnight Mass a couple years ago? It, it only cost me $250. Right. Um, my personal opinion is it, it seems a bit unseemly to be doing something like that, to be using the sacrifice of the Mass to, you know, hey, you, you can come one minute before and we've got the, all these pews roped off for you because you paid money. Now, I understand the need to make money, to raise money. That, that just seems a little bit unseemly. That would, it would bother me as well. Um, it wouldn't bother me to raffle off a parking space right in front of the church. But to do something that is, is right there in, in the church, uh, 
you know, I don't know. I, I, I would not be in favor of it. Uh, it. It would be bothersome to me. So, you, no, you're, you're not alone. You're not necessarily crazy. But I don't know that there's necessarily anything that you could say that this is wrong or, or uh, um, you know, some sort of rule or regulation of the church against doing something like that. But uh, so, you know, just voice your concern to the Father and say, Got no problem with the parking space, and I, you know, unless you do. But uh, the pew in the mass, the holy sacrifice of the mass, and it's coming down to, to money. To it just, like I said, it seems a bit unseemly to me. Quickly, we'll head to Sioux City, Iowa. Steve is in Sioux City, listening to EWTN Radio. Steve, you're on with John Martinoni. Hello. Hi, Steve. What's your question? Um, it's about day home, Mary. Uh huh. Um, I was, uh, I took my dad to the chemo treatment and I was praying the Hail Mary in my head. Um, how are my intentions going to be known if I just pray the Hail Mary? Do I need to first ask, you know, for, uh, less anxiety and more comfort or should I just pray the Hail Mary in my head? You can just say the Hail Mary in your head. Um, is, now it was your question... How, how does Mary hear that? Or I'm not sure about... Well, yeah, how does, how, does, uh, how does Mary know that we're afraid? Oh, okay, okay. Um, look, we've got in, in the Scripture, um, there's a verse in the New Testament where it says the angels in heaven rejoice over um, a, a sinner who, who changes his ways, a, a, basically a conversion. Well, most sinners don't just yell out, oh, I've changed my... Conversion is of the heart. So it's something interior to them. Well, how do the angels know about this? Well, they know about it because Jesus allows them to know about it. Same way with Mary. She's perfectly united to the body of Christ. How does Mary know what's in our hearts, what's in our minds? Because of the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. It's not her own power and authority. It's Jesus' power and authority. That's like... The, the story Jesus tells of Lazarus and the rich man. You know, the rich man dies, goes to a place of torment. Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. bosom. The rich man says, Abraham, send someone back to talk to my brothers. Well, if you read the story, it seems like Abraham knows the hearts and the minds of his brothers. How? By the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Where can they find more of what you do? BibleChristianSociety.com. It's all free. BibleChristianSociety.com. Once again, we're getting ready to tape a Christmas, a day after Christmas edition of EWTN's Open Line. Jake in Burton, Ohio, if you want to hang on the line, we'd be happy to take your question. If you want to continue to call, please feel free to do so. On behalf of our host, John Martinoni, producer Elena Rodriguez, call screener Matt Gabensky. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in. Until we get together next time, God bless.